Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our session today on moving towards a circular economy in Asia. My name is JJ, and I'm an investor relations manager at Gobi Partners. Today, we have Helen Burdett, who leads the World Economic Forum's work on circular economy innovation, including its flagship initiative called Scale360, which we'll, we'll talk about a bit later. Um, with her on the panel is Lipa Olsolskaita, who is the Ellen MacArthur Foundation Circular Pioneer, currently co-leading Scale360 in Bangkok through the Global Shaper community. Um, this session will be moderated by Gobi Partners Head of Circular Economy, Carlo Delantar. Carlo, please take it away. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining our talk on circular economy in Asia. And for this first session, we will be talking about moving Asia from a linear to circular economy. With me today is the Circular Economy Innovation Lead at the World Economic Forum, Helen Burdett. Hi, Helen. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me here. Thank you so much for making time. So we'll go straight to the questions. Um, in a simplified manner, and I know you have a lot of uh, things to say for this, but what is a circular economy and how is this different from sustainability? Absolutely, big topic. And I know that you have um, a lot of expertise and thoughts on this too, so we can, we can chat it through a little bit. But as we think about circular economy, um, I, I go back to what we, the title is for this event of moving from linear to circular. So it's a way of thinking about how goods and services and products and how we work as an economy, moving from design and create and pull resources out of the earth to meet those needs, create new products, use them and then dispose of them. And that is, that leads us to the sustainability piece that is not sustainable. We cannot do that indefinitely. Uh, we run into resource scarcity problems. We have challenges around waste, but the circular economy lends to sustainability, kind of that means to making human interaction on this earth work in the long term uh, is kind of that end-to-end -end flow. So it's not only focusing on waste or recycling, uh, but looking at the entire value chain uh, and thinking of circularity as uh, the design challenges and as re reuse and how we use things and how we think about the items uh, that we interact with. And a good point on reimagining things, right? How this is more of a systemic approach. Um, I'm curious when we talk about circular economy throughout the supply chain, is this going to reflect our low tech type of applications to high tech, there's definitely a fourth industrial revolution um, application here. Where do you see most of the impact will be coming from for the next uh, years to come? So I think there are many approaches uh, to tackling the transition and the transformation of the economy to make it more circular. One area that we see having tremendous potential to accelerate that impact is around fourth industrial revolution technologies. There are many low tech solutions that we should not rule out. We also need to be looking at those from reusing t-shirts to some of the consumer activity that we can do or changing our own behaviors. But blockchain can be a game changer in tracing materials through supply chains and artificial intelligence can help uh, us better manage inventory to reduce waste. So there are many applications of the new wave of technology uh, to transform from linear to circular in the way that technology has transformed other industries from healthcare to transportation. And when we talk about Asia, most specifically, right, uh, there's definitely uh, a lot of countries in Asia that are trying to leapfrog from the current state towards, you know, a globalizing state. So, which brings me to the next question. The World Economic Forum has dedicated work towards the circular economy from Number one, advancing leadership commitment through the platform of accelerating the circular economy, PACE for short, with a community of over 200 members consisting of public, private, international, and civil society leaders spanning 18 projects around the globe and counting. The second one, transforming material value chains, advancing circular models from plastics, electronics, battery cars to fashions or textile. And lastly, scaling innovation and the fourth industrial revolution that includes Scale360, an initiative to fast track the fourth industrial revolution impact in the circular economy by bringing together public and private sector leaders and innovators to foster dynamic local 
and regional ecosystems for innovation. Just saying that seems like it's a broad and wide system we need to tackle. So I'd love to get your insights on Asia in general and how this weaves towards the initiatives you guys are working at the forum. So well done, uh, outlining each of those three major pillars of work that we undertake at the forum. And that mouthful doesn't even kind of bring in some of the cross-cutting efforts that we have around kind of driving innovation across all of our different efforts to that target the SDGs. It also doesn't incorporate the work that we do with trade uh, or the cross-cutting climate initiatives. So there's lots of activity that happens at the forum that's targeted at this transition uh, and that's targeted at uh, the aims of it, which are sustainability and climate uh, and making the way that we kind of interact with our world more sustainable and recognizing Asia as the fastest growing market and a huge market. We have uh, the annual meeting of new champions each year uh, in China. We recently hosted a circular economy round table in Japan, the uh, special annual meeting this year. So the Davos of 2021 will be happening in Singapore uh, in August of this year. And the, the Scale 360 initiative, which I know we're gonna talk a little bit about later in this session, and, and Lipa has joined us to do that, uh, is also growing presence in Asia with the Bangkok uh, Global Shapers Initiative, in addition to what we will soon launch as a national program in Singapore for accelerating circular economy innovation. So it's just a few uh, of, of kind of many activities that, that the forum undertakes given the, the importance of the region. Awesome, and uh, we'd like to bring in Lipa, uh, the Bangkok Scale 360 lead, and also an Ellen MacArthur Foundation Circular Economy Pioneer. Hi, Lipa, welcome to the show. Hi, Carlo, pleasure to be here. Now we're talking about Scale 360. And uh, for me, when I think about the Scale 3, 360, uh, the circular playbook is definitely something that comes to mind. It's so thorough, it's, it's well-made. And when I look through it, the first thing I think about is the buy-in, buy-in of countries to actually accept circular economy as the right transition moving forward. So I guess my question here would be, how can countries and ecosystem players in this region buy into this initiative? How can potential stakeholders join this initiative? Great question. And I think, first of all, there's an economic incentive in there. As Helen was explaining, you are designing out of waste. That's one of the key pillars for circular economy. So instead of wasting resources and letting them leak into the system, what you're bringing, what you're doing, you're bringing the resources back. So there's a strong economic case. If you look into not necessarily two year plans because that's not gonna work, but if you look further five, 10 years, you can see how that can make a return on the business. And as well, just a strong consumer push in terms of uh, becoming more circular, becoming more in tune with the environmental capacity or the, uh, our planet's capacity. And I think businesses are switching towards that and they really are looking for ways to get there, but they really don't know how, especially in Southeast Asia, because it's quite a new concept. We jumped from sustainability a few years back into now full on circular economy and companies need that transition. And I think you mentioned playbook and that's a really good tool to actually follow and bring the stakeholders together to think about the big systemic challenges and identify at least a small part of that, of what we can address together and identify the themes that we care and the things that we can actually take into action. Ellen? So I think kind of everything that Leepa said, uh, and then we also have ways to plug into uh, kind of the, the global scale 360 community. Uh, so we work on a platform called Uplink which is a global digital uh, community that's driving innovation across all of the SDGs. And we have a circular economy innovation topic there with our Scale 360 action group uh, that connects not only the, the work that the hub is doing in Bangkok, but also all of the other Scale 360 global programs from our first partner with a national program in the UAE, the government there, 
uh, to our national programs in Chile and Germany and India and the city level programs with the shapers in Mexico City and Turin and Brussels. So we're continuing to grow this network, not only with where the programs are that are using the playbook. So each of those geographies I just mentioned has used the methodology that uh, Lipa mentioned that uses de design thinking and kind of facilitation techniques to go from what is circular economy? What can I do uh, to accelerate kind of and support innovators in the space? So how do I get new ideas to scale uh, that can help us with that transition by identifying core challenges to take action? So we kind of start big and start with these big challenges. And then what the playbook does is really drive decision-making on, well, what can we actually do about it? And so the Uplink community is a good way to plug into this at kind of an interest level to learn more about what's happening. And then another is to consider whether your organization or kind of it makes sense for you to plug in and use the playbook yourself to, to drive some of this at an ecosystem level or reach out to those that are driving it in, in your region. Awesome. And uh, here in Gobi, we have 13 offices all around the Pan-Asian region. And when we look at the circular economy, it just makes sense, right? When we talk about it's, it's one connected ecosystem. However, when we think about circular economy, we want the whole economy to actually connect and have this fluid system. However, we're still figuring out what that means. I'm curious if Scale360, the Global Scale360 Initiative, um, addresses that, right? Uh, you, you talked about the UAE, the Chile, uh, there's definitely uh, Singapore and as well as Japan and of course Global Shapers community too, right? And Bangkok Hub. I'm curious how that weaves when we, we're talking about this global circular economy. It's a bit hard to, to think about, especially for our audience, imagining it in a simplified manner. I'm curious how you would explain that. I would say that it starts local, that there's a real reason that we engage with partners that operate at a city and a country level, because trying to tackle this only from a global scale, I think can lead to a lot of talk and make it very difficult to have the level of impact that we want. That said, there are kind of other initiatives outside of Scale360 that Scale360 partners with uh, that have kind of the ear of the global organizations that can plug into these local efforts. Uh, to kind of marry the two efforts. So we have the platform for accelerating circular economy. Scale 360 is an affiliate program to PACE and PACE members, government and businesses alike are interested in connecting with Scale 360 programs. Similarly, the global program of Scale 360 sits within the World Economic Forum where we are able to service it with our members and work with the public, private, civil society collaboration lens to create that at a local level as well as a global level. So I think it takes both. Uh, in order to have move the global needle, in order to have that change, we need to be doing things at a city level. Uh, it kind of takes all of the above to, to initiate that. And, and Lipa, uh, maybe briefly, we'd like to know what the Bangkok Hub is doing at the scale 360 pilot, Helen was talking about the grassroots part, right? Going, go, going a bit local, and that's how innovation ecosystem started, especially the tech ecosystem. But for the circular economy, I know you have so many projects for this pilot, but please let us know what you're doing and how this revolves around that transition. Sure, I will start maybe from the role of our hub and how it plays in uh, in the bigger scale 360 picture. So. Firstly, we, we call ourselves as the ecosystem builders and the, the word ecosystem is thrown around quite a lot these days, especially in grassroots or in sustainable development themes. And what it really means in simplified terms is that it's a community where members depend on each other. And that's how we look at this task. We look into the ecosystem players. So they might be grassroots organizations, government organizations, uh, development organizations, or even startups, nonprofits, and so forth. And we really look and try to listen to their needs. So again, following that empathize uh, kind of design thinking process and understanding what is it that we all need together? What is the common goal? And once we identify that goal, we 
try to combine the resources because usually these organizations are quite uh, resource poor in a sense that they're run by volunteers if they're grassroots run by communities and the one thing you don't have is time and just the hands-on work that has to be done on the ground. And that's where we come in with Shaper Community. We don't try to reinvent the wheel. We really try to go and help those that have already started and started like popping up these ecosystem bubbles. And we try to help there with our network and also our approach coming from Gen Z, Gen Y generation, which is now comprising the largest generation in, in the world. And I think that helps because the businesses have started listening because that's their consumers. So they're, they're paying a close attention. And coming to the second part of what we're doing here in Bangkok, there are three projects that we're currently running. And the goal is really to bring circular economy as a way to solve the issues that we see currently in Thailand. One issue that we are addressing is uh, clean air. And we're using circular economy as an example of how crop residue, instead, instead of burning, it could be used as a resource for other material production. Uh, and that we are collaborating with grassroots organizations uh, and building a campaign, an awareness campaign that is actionable and makes citizen voices heard. The second project is really just collaborating with the government and uh, encouraging and inspiring students to design with circularity in mind. And if not for Scale360, circularity wouldn't even have been a topic there. So we're really happy that we're, we managed to bring an angle to it, to this hackathon style event. And the third one is the collaborating together with JZ, which is an international development organization on a pilot project to transition from a single use plastic to circular alternatives. And we do that by connecting startups in Thailand that already offer those solutions and need to scale, but not necessarily have demand yet from the businesses, connecting then with Phuket municipality and the businesses there to create sort of a demand and supply matching solution. Awesome. And I guess uh, when we now we're talking about the global and local perspectives, right? I'd love to know your thoughts on the challenges, you know, starting this whole initiative, uh, Helen on Scale360 in a global aspect and Lipa when it comes locally. I'm sure you have different uh, and would be really good for the audience to take notes as well. Your, the question makes me think of, um, back when we were doing our design consultations. So in early 2020, uh, when we had the idea for the initiative, but hadn't really designed what it would look like in implementation yet, and hadn't built the playbook. And we were meeting with circular economy experts and those in the, the forum community. And we met with one of our now board members, uh, Robert Metzk from Phillips. And he had said to us, uh, be the ivy, not the tree to think about kind of how we climb up uh, the existing infrastructure uh, to transform it uh, and to provide services that are missing or kind of fill in gaps. And that was some of the seeds for how we designed and created the playbook that thinks about what is needed in a specific local ecosystem. So there are many programs out there that can help you design a new innovation challenge, but if your winners can't achieve their goals for scale or don't have access to the capital they need or their investors aren't patient in a way that circular trailblazers need because they are transforming the economic system as well as introducing their new business idea, uh, there's tremendous potential for them to succeed, but sometimes their needs are a little bit different. And to target those challenges, to understand what they are in a specific environment and, and target them and tackle them. And so we thought, well, how do we define those geographies? And what we came up with in the process of developing the playbook is that each partner needs to define that for themselves. 
whether that's in a municipality or that's in a city, or I could even see it being at a subsidy level, there are activities you could take on. It may not be for the whole innovation ecosystem. You're not going to take on national policy from a subsidy level, but there are actions that you can take to help uh, incite and inspire more circular economy innovation. And so that was how we took kind of the global to local lens um, in building those programs and, and building partnerships to drive those programs forward and then providing that connective mesh. So bringing together all of our partners so that people can learn from each other and providing a platform, and this is on Uplink, where people can communicate or showcase their ideas and give that visibility that's needed uh, when you're tackling circular economy challenges. Eba? I'm just thinking about the, the challenges in terms of local perspective and how we went about it. I think really it's a, it's a blessing and a curse uh, having a lot of energy, especially from volunteers. So we come in with a lot of ideas and thoughts and that's really a blessing because you just share that energy with people in the room and they see that you believe in what you're doing. At the same time, it's hard to maintain that energy and momentum when you're a group of volunteers. So in our case here in, at Shapers and also with some of the organizations that we collaborate with, everyone has full-time jobs. And then this comes as an addition, which again, just shows how much energy we have for the topic and passion. But what you need to do, I think, to succeed is to have this practical idealist mindset, which sounds contradictory, but you have to have that passion and vision for something greater than yourself. But at the same time, you need someone or you need a group of people that act as the strategic vehicle behind and who can direct that energy from the group and from the different stakeholders into a certain goal, focusing on a small change that can have a ripple effect and can be showcased as a best practice and then implement it from one province to another. And that's how the ecosystem actually grows by proven track record of success. Okay. And I guess when you're talking about the crucial aspects of both your perspectives, uh, I'm curious how we leapfrog, especially in Asia, right? there's definitely more factors we need to take in. Um, you know, the developing economies, uh, we're talking about technology adoption and uh, language barrier. There's a lot of cultural aspects that we need to, to think about. What do you think are the crucial steps, especially for the audience, when they think about supporting the circular economy? Nipa, you were talking about, you know, support is very important for the next steps and the buy-in on a global perspective. So uh, I guess for the audience to take note and hopefully be part of this um, initiative long-term, I'm, I'm curious what would that be for them to bring back home? I can perhaps talk from my own experience, how I encountered the circular economy and uh, how I got hooked on the concept and that was through a community. For those who are listening, check what are the circular economy events happening next time. Maybe there is a community event organized as a workshop. That's what happened to me. I went there, I met people who are just inspired by circular economy and that created a sense of belonging. Uh, you're, you're not alone trying to change the world, but there, there is a community around it. For companies, of course, they can reach out to World Economic Forum that's uh, already you know, leading on the global scale. But really just being curious. I think like with anything in life, you just have to have the curiosity to open other doors that you may not have seen before. Ellen? The, for the community, I will give a plug to our Uplink community because it does have that global audience. So if you're not sure where to start in terms of plugging into circular economy at, at a workshop, because there aren't too many of those in person right now, uh, you're kind of welcome in the Scale360 community there. There are many circular economy communities where you may feel everyone here knows what they're talking about. I, I'm new to this. I'm not sure what it is. And I would say don't be daunted by that. Uh, there is some different language and there are some buzzwords. You'll pick up on them very quickly. And there are kind of many open communities like the Scale360 uh, and Uplink community where we want to welcome people to the fold. And, and, and the more the merrier. To your question, Carlo, around what do we need and what can be done, uh, I will kind of give a, another 
sort of shout out to some research that we did with an organization called Scale Up Nation uh, late last year and published in January, and that's around circular trailblazing. So the idea of changing the marketplace, not only growing your own business, so going beyond lockstep, uh, and the research really targeted scale ups and identified four primary areas where ecosystem support is needed to support trailblazing. And those areas were around providing platforms for storytelling. And I think the investment community can absolutely do that by showcasing um, kind of the organizations that they're investing in or even the way that they're developing their portfolios uh, and providing opportunities to showcase new kind of stories, new businesses, new ideas. Another is knowledgeable investors. So by attending this fireside chat, you're, you're one step closer uh, to kind of being more knowledgeable about what circular economy trailblazers need. And uh, that's crucial to supporting the, the ecosystem for them. Uh, consultative policymakers, getting uh, innovators a seat at the table to be heard. And finally, market connectivity. So this is building networks. So that's attending the, the events where you meet other individuals who are working in the space, whether they be virtual or in person and joining up with some of those communities to become more connected, uh, to build this movement so that it isn't many disjointed activities around the world, but actually a global movement toward a common goal. Awesome, way to end it. And uh, really appreciate uh, both of your time today. Um, I guess when we talk about the next steps for circular economy in Asia, uh, we'll definitely see both of you in that conversation. There's definitely a wealth of resources, networks and communities that are already uh, being discussed during this session. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. And now we will transition to the live Q&A. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, really appreciative for everyone joining. Um, we have a very healthy turnout rate and uh, I guess we'll start with the Q&A. Um, so let's bring in uh, Lipa and Helen. Helen, Lipa, thank you so much for joining us again. Hi, how are you guys doing? Good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> Hi there. Awesome, so uh, for everyone here, I, there seems to be a lot of questions from currently now and also from during the rest of the, uh, registration process. So um, if uh, I'd love to go through all of them as much as we can. So I guess we can uh, consider this as a blitz Q&A session. So to premise everyone that's joining this call, you know, Asia accounts for around 60% of the world's population and Asian countries have become global manufacturing hubs. That's the fact. Um, and uh, another good fact is, uh, China and India transitioning to the circular economy will reap benefits in savings and economic opportunities of an estimate of 10 trillion US dollars by 2040 and 624 billion dollars by 2050 respectively. And this brings me to my first question, where do we even start, right? So um, whoever wants to, uh, to, to, to answer, please feel free. Uh, so the first question is, if an industry professional or an individual is first looking into circular economy, where should they start? I see Lipa staying on mute, so I'll jump in on this one. Uh, I think that the first place to start is to begin to educate yourself uh, on you know, the depth of research that has already been undertaken in circular. Uh, to understand the different models. Uh, I saw kind of another question around, well, how do we do this from a services perspective um, when we're, we maybe aren't producing products? And then we look at products as a service and um, platforms and all sorts of different kind of approaches to circular economy. And I think learning about some of those is the best place to start and starting to think about it from a kind of consumer or personal level. Uh, I think at least for me, uh, helps me to bring it into my kind of work and see the bigger picture, um, kind of from integrating it um, kind of throughout my life. Lipa? I would tend to agree with Helen. I think it's first it's important to get down to the basics. And there are a lot of organizations that are already working towards it. Uh, one of them is the Ellen McCart Foundation. And they have a lot of great tools to actually go through the design thinking process or the circular design guide, that's a free resource that you can access uh, online. And you can start thinking of how to bring your business to those circular practices. 
and you can always reach out to them. And same with the World Economic Forum. I think these are two very strong organizations working towards circular change. And uh, on the same note, there are local uh, grassroots or small uh, NGOs that are also working towards circular economy. And I think it's just important to start connecting those dots and don't be afraid to ask silly questions. That's where the change starts. Okay. Growth versus development. Can we innovate fast enough? How fast? So I would say that we need both. Um, that it can't be growth versus development. Um, we have to find ways to decouple resource consumption and growth, uh, which is what we target when we're looking at, at circular economy. Um, so I'd say, yes, we can, uh, but maybe not with that attitude. And I would just add that, uh, you know, it's a transition, it's not a transformation. It takes time to go from linear to circular. There's a whole uh, system that needs to change and that starts from one small part and then has a ripple effect. And I think a lot of the times we tend to demonize say, oil or other resources that are heavily extracted right now, but we have to remember that the way we went through history and we went from you know, steam engines to uh, alternative uh, energy, there has always been a transition. So let's say now we need oil to build wind turbines, but maybe in the future that will not be the case. So there's a period of transition and we have to understand that the, there will be sacrifices that we will make along the way. We cannot jump from, you know, step one to step five. And this leads me to a three, six, uh, scale 360 question. How can VCs in this region work with Scale 360 to implement circular economy across their portfolio? There are kind of a few different avenues to engage with Scale 360. One is through the programs that are implementation focused. So where we have partners that are um, building interventions. So building some of the, the different approaches that Leifa mentioned they're doing in Bangkok. And we have programs launching uh, sort of at the national level in India and in Singapore. And we partner with our, the World Economic Forum Centers for Fourth Industrial Revolution. And that's another great place to engage uh, with the forum and with Scale360 uh, on circularity. I think, so we, there are a few different pieces there. There's uh, kind of the advisory board level. So each program puts together working groups and advisory boards to provide input into design in terms of how the initiatives will be set up and what they'll really do from an activity level. And being engaged at uh, those early stages of design will help to kind of shape the intervention so that they are um, kind of targeted at the investor community should the investor community be interested. Uh, and then at a global level and kind of more across the region that's maybe not with specific programs and implementation, uh, I really recommend joining our Uplink community. It's a growing community and you know, we want to hear from you. And so uh, I think uh, the link was put in the chat earlier, but if you check that out, you can kind of post on there with your questions. You can start to engage with people who are um, interested in circular economy innovation. We have innovators there. We have um, kind of professional services firms and kind of experts, and we have other investors. And so it's kind of a good community or place to start learning what you can do. Deepa? And from, from a local perspective in Bangkok, we have three interventions as mentioned before. So there's one focused on plastic, on reduction of single use plastic. Another one is focused on clean air policies and just bringing in circular economy lens into it. And the third one is the design process, so encouraging of the next generation to think in circularity. So if, if these are areas of interest for you, that's something that you support in the region or specifically in Thailand, then do get in touch with us and I will drop an email address in the chat box. We are volunteer run, there's no funding. So sponsorships will be um, a very important aspect for us to really bring those interventions to life. Okay, down to our last question. I know it's short and sweet. Uh, I guess let's talk about outcomes and outputs that have been practiced and uh, have been recognized in, in, in the circular economy world. Uh, Surawat uh, wanted to ask, uh, can you please share some of the most inspiring circular economy success cases you have encountered or heard, or heard about so far? I get inspired by some of the kind of 
new materials that, that are coming out that are just replacing um, materials that we have in circulation that we don't know what to do with or we can't do much with at the end. I think polymateria is a great example of that uh, where they're creating kind of new plastics. Um, so that's kind of one angle is around new materials. I think those case studies can be a, a lot of fun and something to, to check out and look into. And then I did kind of in the panel segment mention some of the blockchain and AI applications. And from a technology perspective, I find the uh, kind of applications to optimizing the kind of business processes and value chains from a supply chain perspective really interesting because there are some of the solutions that are most targeted at um, things businesses care about. So they're around kind of helping the bottom line while making um, businesses more circular. And I think um, those are where we're gonna be able to see the most gains and the most adoption. So I think those are pretty exciting too. From my side, uh, there are so many, I see it hard to choose one. I really like the transition from owning a product to leasing it or to having a product as a service. You can have you know, a virtual wardrobe where you experiment uh, and you get new items every month, but that does not mean that you need to buy new items. You just hire them for an occasion or hire for a couple of days and so on. And there are just so many of those services uh, popping up, especially in Europe, but I do think that it's coming to Asia as well. And that's a huge opportunity, especially given the generation Y and Z who do not want to compromise on convenience and do not want to compromise on their authenticity and freedom of expression, which they do see through fashion or through lifestyle items. And that's a way to really capture that audience that is also environmentally conscious. And another one is just really seeing the heroes of today just stepping up in their communities and organizing workshops or organizing, uh, you know, a waste separation into 12 different uh, types that's happening in Indonesia, currently in one of the provinces. And it's just really great to see that with one person, you can start almost a movement. So these, these two just categories for me, product as a service and just community leaders really stand out and inspire. Thank you so much. Hey, and that Carlo, I want to mm -hmm. I want to add on to the product as a service point. Um, I right. think that it's it's more than I think that the dresses and the the fashion pieces and the consumer pieces are are super fun, um, but it can be a lot more than that. Um, the the one of the kind of key examples that comes to mind around product as a service is actually a heavy machinery uh, company that's based out of the UAE called Tendered uh, leases heavy machinery that re significantly reduces idling and downtime. And they're measuring their success against metrics of idling and downtime, um, as well as kind of how often their products are leased out. Uh, and so those types of models can be broadly applicable from business to business and business to consumer lenses. Awesome. Again, thank you so much. Uh, we'll wrap up the Q&A. I know we will continue the conversation tomorrow during our clubhouse. Uh, event. Uh, JJ will talk more about that. But again, thank you so much, Helen and Lipa, for joining this talk. I'm super, super happy and grateful. It's been years since we've been talking about circular economy, and finally, Asia's moving, and we're part of that. So thank you again. Uh